You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club, a home for those interested in international trade, shipping, procurement, logistics, and air freight. In fact, all things supply chain in the Americas, Asia, and beyond. This podcast is brought to you by your host, Mike King, and produced in partnership with Demurco Express Group, a global 3PL that specializes in managing logistics to, from, and within the Asia-Pacific region. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike King, and this is the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with Demerco Express Group. We're available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Please follow and subscribe. You'll also find all episodes at www.thefreightbuyersclub.com, where you can subscribe to receive each episode direct to your inbox. Now, let's get started. The world right now is a rather battered, bruised and confusing place for anyone in charge of global supply chains. If you're in the business of freight buying, well, that's getting more expensive and less reliable once again. So today the plan is to deliver some advice and perspective by drawing on the experience of someone who has been through a lot of supply chain shocks before. He has been a leading container shipping analyst, forwarder, scheduling manager and salesperson. He was global head of logistics at Electrolux for 16 years, during which time his team and he moved millions of TUs and hundreds of thousands of tons of air freight. Currently, he's the executive director for international transport at American Multinational Cummins, which manufactures and designs a whole range of heavy equipment, including engines and generators, and is on the cutting edge of alternative fuel systems. I'm delighted to welcome to the Freight Buyers Club, Bjorn van Jensen. How are you, Bjorn? I'm well, uh, Mark, and happy new year. Happy new year to you. Okay, later we're going to be looking at firefighting strategy in supply chains, what's going on currently in terms of lines, rate management, and container shipping operations, where line of strategy is going. And we'll be looking at the lead up to Chinese New Year and the long term implications of all of this geopolitical strife. But first up, well, it has to be, doesn't it? Today, we, Hapagloid and Maersk, are happy to announce a long term collaboration. We have named this new collaboration Gemini Corporation to underpin that we are two like minded partners coming together to lift our joint ambition of delivering a. That was Maersk and Hapag Lloyd CEOs, Vincent Clerk and Rolf Haven Janssen, forming Gemini Cooperation to deliver, and I quote, a flexible and interconnected ocean network with industry-leading reliability. This collaboration, which will have almost 300 modern vessels with combined capacity of 3.4 million TU and over 20% of global container shipping capacity, is going to offer 26 mainline services supported by a network of shuttle services. Obviously, Maersk had already announced his 2M alliance with MSC would end in January 2025. Gemini cooperation with Hapag Lloyd is set to take effect from February of the same year. Bjorn, was this a surprise given that Maersk is thought to have instigated the split from MSC and CEO Vincent Clerk has said previously his carrier wasn't interested in a new vessel sharing agreement and would go it alone? It was a surprise, like it was a surprise to anyone. But when you really think about it, I don't know whether it's a surprise. The conventional wisdom had it that most wanted full control over its own network in order to leverage that network to grow the end-to-end logistics or end-to-end supply chain business. And the notion which I subscribed to was control of your own network as a lever for growing your supply chain business makes an awful lot of sense. If you're going to go out and promise a customer something on the end-to-end supply chain side, being in a position to deliver on the international piece without having to ask anyone else, it, it made a ton of sense. I think the world caught up to, to, to that idea, though, which was a grand idea at the time. But then rates went through the floor, and most logistic business did not do as well. Let's just be diplomatic about it, as they had thought it would by quite some distance. So in that sense, for them to look for another partner made some sense. And I think, honestly, the choice of APAC as a partner is an excellent choice. The cultural fit is there. They share executives or so people who worked for each other over the years. They share a commitment to schedule reliability and, and, and they even share proximity. That's one thing. So all, the, all those boxes are tick that makes a ton of sense. What is maybe overlooked is also it's an absolutely brilliant chess move in the sense that 
the remaining partners in the alliance are not going to have to find someone else because otherwise they can't go on as an alliance. But if they pick any other one of the big ones, they're going to be in violation of any number of rules around maximum market share for an alliance. So it's a little bit of a, it's maybe not checkmate, but it's certainly check to three uh, important and competent competitors who are now really going to scramble to figure out what they're going to do about this. So, you know, hats off for the move, hats off for the choice of partner to both Apog and, and, and Maersk. What remains to be seen is whether they can deliver on these promises that they make, which are pretty ambitious and eye-catching. I want to come back to what impact Hapag Lloyd's departure from the alliance and where that leaves Wan Yang Ming and HMM. Hapag Lloyd was the lead carrier in that alliance. I want to come back to those options, but let's stick with cultural alignment or alignment. Now, as you mentioned there, Maersk's strategy was to become a supply chain integrator, and it was looking more for shipper business direct. And I said being an independent carrier would help all of this, whereas Hapag Lloyd has always been more traditionally focused on port-to-port -port business. It's always seen forwarders more as a key part of its customer base. I mean, the two carriers also have divergent decarbonization targets. So how are they going to bring that alignment together? Okay, they've got cultural alignment, but I mean, Toft at MSC was ex mess so so was Rolf Haber and Janssen. Yeah, but Rolf is ex, ex Demco, right, or ex, ex Nedlard as well, I suppose. But cultural is not just about whether the two CEOs are from the same country or I work from the same company. It's, a, it's the entire corporate culture. And, and that's not to cast aspersions on either one. It's just to note that MSC's corporate culture is radically different from the culture in Maersk. And either one is fit for purpose, but together it didn't work very well. And that's, that is as, as, as made me. I just think generally as someone who's worked a lot with Hapa and Maersk there, commitment to shipping excellence and, and to pushing the envelope, for example, with HAPA pushing into RF equipped containers and really truly traceable in real time containers and things like this, they share a much more common goal on the IT side as well, which let's be honest, was also always an area where MSC lagged behind and, and, and still does. I see nothing but good here. I mean, the carbon goals are different. I don't know how different they are, I'll be honest. I think this is stuff that can be ironed out. I think it's it's both the cultural thing, but it's also this very brilliant chess move that, that really forces a lot of people to change the way they do things or be left behind, but also puts a lot of people in a pickle in terms of who they're going to sign up with, right? They're very clever. Hold that thought, Bjorn. You mentioned some of the big promises that made. One of them was they're talking about improving schedule reliability to above 90%, which is miles off most recent performance for both. HAPAG yeah. was down to 55% reliability in November, according to Sea Intelligence. Yeah. So I guess, you know, that's a great target. Is it believable or achievable, do you think? I think it's achievable if all the planets line up. I was actually with Musk today in a long planned meeting and I took the opportunity to ask that question. I was interested also because I used to be a vessel scheduling manager in Maersk, albeit 25 or 30 years ago, when we certainly had those levels of accuracy. And if you look at why we had those levels of accuracy quite consistently back then, those factors that, that gave us that consistency and that reliability are the same factors that Maersk and Hapak are now saying that they want to put into place. That is much more of a hub and spoke model with fewer port calls per string and bigger feeder vessels, right? So up to six, 7,000 TU feeder vessels serving the hubs, right? So as acting as the spokes and fewer partners to ask permission and the focus on selected strings, I believe it's 15 strings or something like that. I think it can be done. And the last component, which is ultra important is also control over the terminals that are being called on those strings that they're focusing on. These are our terminals. We own them or manage them. We control them. We don't have to ask anyone else. We're not subject to whatever else went wrong with some other carrier. We still in a, own the network, right? We just sort of added another player into it, but the network is wholly owned by the partners. And I think if all of those planets line up, I think it's doable. I think that will then potentially reshape the entire shipping world because if the Gemini, uh, what do they call it? Cooperation? can't deliver 90% schedule accuracy, then that's a 
game changer in terms of market share, and the others will have no choice but to build very similar models to the extent that they can. And that will change the whole world's shipping networks dramatically. So, you know, and I don't think anybody's going to wait until February 2025 to put in place changes like that of their own. So I would expect in six to seven months, you'll start seeing a lot of other carriers coming out with similar type networks because they can't afford to sit wait potentially lose enormous market share to a Gemini corporation that can, that can deliver that. So really interesting to watch. But yes, I think it's doable. So you, you use the, uh, the the chess metaphor. Maybe that's checkmate. Is the Queen's Gambit, is it the state of the alliance? What next for one <laughs> Yang Ming and HMM? <laughs> I, what options do they have left? Don't. I wish I knew, Mike. Uh, what, what I do know is that there are now, because of these rules and how much market share a given corporation or alliance or whatever you want to call it now, can have, the options are limited for the others, right? The alliance could not bring in the CMA or an MSC without being in violation of a whole bunch of percentages that are sacrosanct uh, in, in the regulatory framework. What other players are there that they can bring in? Maybe you'll see an, a, a, wholly, a fully Asian alliance. I'm just playing mind games, right? With Costco being the big player to some of these Asian carriers that are now left in the lurch, right? But I, I don't know, honestly. Uh, I know that it's certainly a gambit and it requires and it will require an answer and it will get one and it'll be exciting to watch. Watch this space. Okay, Bjorn, before we come to what's sort of gonna happen later in 2024, I, I just want to look at how you go about planning supply chains. If can we go back two or three months? Can you tell me before the chaos sort of hit the world in the Middle East, can you tell me what you'd done to prepare your global logistics strategy for this year in terms of that planning process? What does it look like, the process itself? And and how do you balance as part of that? How would you go about buying your freight? Is it a mix between forwarders and direct with carriers in terms of ocean? Yeah, without going into, let's say, specific market splits or splits between one or the other, we took the view already back in late 2022 that as this crisis from COVID became an on crisis, and nobody could foresee how quickly that would happen, but we knew that it would happen, that we got caught out, like a lot of shippers got caught out. And that is what it is, but shame on us if we get caught out again. And, uh, and then we looked at what, what was it that caught us out? And a lot of that was a lack of globalization of our logistics activities. Now, I joined Commons partly with that mandate, and with tremendous cooperation from the regions and, and, and hundreds of very dedicated logistics professional in commons, we've come a long way to globalizing our approach, moving towards this shipper of choice paradigm that I think you and I have discussed several times on this podcast. How do you become one? You do that by keeping your promises and keeping your service providers informed and requiring the same of them, but consistency and delivering on promises. And we've gone a long way towards that. And we have, to my knowledge, I have a lot of it, not reneged on a single promise that we made or down to any carrier. And that commands respect from the carriers and the forwarders. And that in turn strengthens our global position. What we're now doing is, is tightening up even more on the planning process, as you say, on the forecasting process, on the communication process on the data process, all of these things that were heavily regionalized for us, becoming much more global in nature. We've made investments on the IT side. We've made investments on the people side. We've integrated much tighter the cooperation between procurement and operations uh, and globalized those to a large extent as well. I think we're in a good place. And it's actually showing now with this Red Sea crisis that again, nobody saw coming, but we're now reacting to that globally and regionally, but principally globally at a much higher level within the service providers organizations than we were before. And that delivers results as well in terms of priority, in terms of space, in terms of just communication around what to expect and what not to expect. I think we're in as good a place as we can be, given that this hit everybody right between the eyes three weeks ago. I think we're, we're in a, a much better place than we might have been two years ago. Uh, that's good enough for me for now. In any case, you asked the split between forwarders and carriers. We are not big enough to be a 100% carrier direct BCO. Our volumes are mid-high. They're not high and they're not really high. They're mid-high and, and that 
basically means that we need to make more use of freight forwarders than, than the really large shippers do. Uh, so we have a certain split between them. One is certainly more favored than the other, and that makes one need to be rebalanced. But I don't think we will go away from having some freight forwarders and some carriers. And to the extent that we operate with carriers to rent, we anyway need to work with the freight forwarders to execute on those contracts on our behalf under a, like a separate management contract. So that won't change. The splits may change. The weightings may change. The big question most people will ask, and maybe it was implicit in your question is, will you go for 12 month rates? So will you continue with the, uh, with short term or will it be a mix? Literally just had that discussion today. Uh, we're undecided on it and we may end up with a hybrid where we commit some volumes on long term rates and this uh, and the rest of it, not on a spot basis, because we're not set up to be spot market shippers, but on a, maybe a quarterly contract basis. That's not a given, but that's, I think, the way a lot of people are going, a lot of ways people are thinking. Another thing people are worried about, I hear that a lot, and I read that a lot, is people are now saying, should we have a tender? Should we not have a tender? Given what's happening now, is this a good time to have a tender? Look, yeah, it is, because this is the season when one has tenders. And the reason it's the season one has tenders is that everything else being equal, this is the slack season, this is when you negotiate. Imperative for most shippers there, if you could give a piece of advice, is have the tenders, but make sure you ring fence the diversion cost and the cost of this crisis as a separate charge that can go away when the world returns to normal. And if you can make that happen, and you can, then by go ahead and have a tender, we certainly will. Bjorn, just on the tendering point, I'll just explain to our, our listeners, I'll, I'll simplify here. On the two big trades, the Asia-Europe ocean freight tendering process, a lot of it happens round about the turn of the year on the Trans-Pacific, starting in maybe February, you come through to April, May, even to June. Are you taking the same approach for both of those trades? And, and maybe could you just explain a little bit about the complexity of your ocean shipping network that you require for those deals on? You're involved in a lot of trades. It's not just those two, is it? Yeah, so I think you're right. A lot of trades, also some of the TP trades, actually, the tender season kicks off in November, December is a more accurate way to put it because it depends on who you are. If you are a forwarder or one of the very large retailers who needs to get ready either to meet the next calendar year's catalog, if you're a retailer, or be ready as a forwarder with rates available to offer in the next round of tenders, then you're right, those contracts are concluded. And, and, and we're very grateful for that, the BCO community, because it gives us an excellent benchmark to beat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, and we often do, not always, but we often do. So most, I think, I'd say BCO, BCOs, other than uh, retailers, we have our global tenders in the period between early January and, as you said, end of April for rates that are that are valid from May 1 and for another 12 months, right? And I don't see any big companies changing that dynamic. I do see some who have the same considerations as we do. Do we hold some of it back and, and, and play with that on quality contracts? I'm not going to reveal what my position on it is, but I have one. I'm not going to sit here and publish that to every carrier in the world and forward in the world, but we'll see. Uh, I think, was it Mike Tyson who said, everyone's got a great plan until they get punched in the nose. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> how, how did your plan, as you outlined it before, how did you go about coping just to give your peers some sort of insight into that process, how did you go about coping with the closure of the Suez Canal? How did that hit you operationally? What was the communication process like with all the different partners internally, externally in that supply chain and your carriers? How did all of that proceed? So we, we've taken that, that level of crisis management to the very senior management levels and all the way down to including the individual planners, individual business units in the individual warehouses. We have mass communications that go on on a daily basis. We have senior management communications that go on on a weekly basis or more, as the case may be. The understanding, I, I think the COVID crisis is still fresh enough in the minds of most senior management that they know that now supply chains can be disrupted and it can happen quickly and it can have an impact and it's not your fault. Clearly, this is nobody's fault. It happens and uh, we're all if you'll pardon the pun, in the same boat, no matter who we are, right? The big question on everyone's mind and one that, that we're also wrestling with is what is the impact? How long is this going to last? The function of, of each other, rather, the impact is a function of how, this is, how long this is going to last. It's also a function of what happens to surcharges in general. 
Uh, will they go up? Right now, I, I think they've found the right level. I think maybe the level is even a little bit higher than it should be, but I'll allow that equipment imbalances also need to be covered. I'd be very surprised if we saw surcharges labeled as such go up much more than they are now. I think they've found the right level. And so you can begin to quantify the impact in terms of, well, this trade's impact of the surcharge is, is this, I have this many to you, one multiplied by the other, multiplied by the number of months you think this is going to take, gives you a pretty decent answer of what's the impact. That's the easy part. The not so easy part is when you get down and deal with the individual planners, and this is not a commerce thing, this is a manufacturing company thing, and, and they start going, well, what is the impact on our working capital of having to increase our inventory by up to three or four weeks? What is the impact on premium freight? How much will we have to move with premium freight options, be that rail, sea, air, or, or air, or courier? That's a sort of a how long is a piece of string type of question. It'll be what it'll be. We'll try and mitigate it. We'll do everything we can to avoid it. And we'll, we'll graduate our responses to shortages, right? Because I think in every manufacturing company I've ever worked for, or even with in my consulting capacity uh, up to a year ago, there's a tendency to reach immediately for the freight lever. Unless you've got an adult in the room that says, hey, Mr. Planner, you're right. You may need air freight, but can we have a conversation? When do you need this by? And you'll find that a lot of people pull the air freight lever because it won't get there quick enough with ocean freight, and that's a fact. But before you then pull the air freight lever, maybe you should ask yourself, is there a rail option? Is there a sea air option? Is there a deferred air option before you go automatically for the most expensive solution? So that process we're driving, a lot of companies are driving that, and those who aren't really should. So all of that is coming together in a, in a quite a well-orchestrated global response, I think. So we have a number, which I'm also not going to give to you, right? It's a big you number. Can. <laughs> yeah, I can, but I won't. It's a big number. I think they're all big numbers for most companies. They will be because this caught everyone unawares. It's also not a crippling number, okay? It, it's a number that in my mind is big, but in the context of, of our own internal risk, management, the parameters should be classified as insignificant. It's clearly not operationally insignificant, but the impact is not so big that this will cause any, any alarm bells uh, on the street or, or anywhere. Uh, it's a cost of doing business. And obviously, with the savings we've made on ocean freight over the last 12 months, there's some fat to give there as well, right? But people need to have that calculation ready. How long is it going to last? I don't know. I think rule number one in crisis management is to be prudent. I hate this death by a thousand cuts of project management. You're afraid of giving people a big number. So you give them the lowest number you can get away with, and then you adjust it every week, upward, 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 upward. I'm a big fan of prudence in crisis management. What's the worst case or what's maybe not the totally worst case, but what's a pretty bad case? And that number is worse than the number I have in front of me right now. But at least I think it, if anything, it'll come down as we progress into this crisis, right? That's the way we do it. I recommend it and people buy it as they should, that this is going to be with us through the middle of summer at the very least. That's not necessarily the war itself. This is the knock-on effect of what's already happened. Before this irons itself out. So this may well end. It could end in two weeks if, if somebody invaded the... Uh, Yemen, but nobody will, right? It could end in all kinds of ways. It could end within the next three months. But when the dust settles, ships will be in all the wrong places. Equipment will be in all the wrong places. It'll take time to reposition. In the meantime, you know, customer networks, customers have adjusted to new networks. Carriers need to, to dust off their old schedules and bring them back and bring assets back in line. Ships that have been cannibalized from smaller services to add vessels to the longer strings will have to come back to where they came from. That takes at least three months. So I'm thinking six months from now, and that's assuming it ends in three. It's a non-answer, but it's a qualified non-answer. We'll just take a short break. We'll be back with you in a second. 
This podcast is proudly produced in partnership with DeMurco Express Group, a trusted provider of global shipping and contract logistics services in Asia, Europe, and North America. DeMurco's particular strength is in Asia, where it gives shippers the freight capacity and local market expertise to streamline freight movements to and from the region, particularly for Trans-Pacific lanes. With 130 forwarding and logistics locations across China, India, and Southeast Asia, DeMurco connects Asia with the world like no other global 3PL. You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club. In the short term, Bjorn, we're already hearing about some of those disruptions that you talk about resulting in, in slot and equipment shortages emerging possibly, well, already, but we've got this crunch period at Chinese New Year and second week of February. Is that something that you're seeing yourself? Yeah, we're seeing it. Not in a big way, but it is starting to show its face, especially in feeder ports in China. And there's no surprise, right? I mean, if you, I think it was last Jensen who said something like there's 380,000 or 400,000 TU per week that normally finds its way back to Asia. So, you know, with a two week long lead time, there's 800,000 TU that are not going to be back in Asia in time for the Chinese New Year rush. That's a lot of boxes. I think overall, there's plenty of containers in the system. I mean, it's not too long ago that Sea Intelligence predicted that as a consequence of the slump in, in ocean shipping fortunes, there'd be 20 million TEU of surplus containers in the world. And they probably are. I don't, I don't think those numbers have changed. The problem is those surplus containers aren't where they should be and won't get there in time. So for sure, there will be a container shortage. And that container shortage also will account for some of the knock-on effects onto trades that are not obvious, right? So people rightfully ask, intuitively, why would an intra-Asia trade be impacted by this? There's nowhere near the Red Sea. Yeah, well, you know as well as I do that, that what happens in one service inevitably spills into the next, good or bad. And I can say the shortage is going to be one of them. Yield management is going to be foremost on the minds of carriers. And uh, intra-Asia may not be where the biggest yields are. I don't know about carrier, but the Middle East could suffer as well. So, yes, it's there. But, I'm also sometimes a little skeptical because I'm a cynical one, as you know, that when we hear about these container shortages and this, the sky may be falling, but I note that the people who are always saying the sky is falling are people who have an interest in the sky falling. <laughs> so how, how real it is, I don't know. It's probably 75% real, but uh, certain players certainly are currently trying to talk the market up. Absolutely. And fair play to them. But that doesn't mean that we should accept point blank everything that's being fed to us. The problem is there is for at least for us, not as big as it's hyped up to be. I could be wrong and we could have a totally different conversation next week, but I don't think so. In the uh, the US market, Bjorn, what are you doing in terms of when you're signing contracts for your US shipment inbound and, and outbound? Are you trying to avoid the East Coast, perhaps, like some shippers have told me they're doing? They're trying to use the Trans-Pacific because... That East Coast obviously is affected by sewers, but we've also got issues with the Panama Canal water levels. With Panama, yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, I think it behooves all shippers who are heavily focused on the East Coast, of which we are one, to reassess. I mean, we've got cargo from Asia that would come up on pendulum services through Suez all the way out through the Bay and Lodes, the U.S. East Coast. Obviously, those are now seeing 10 days to two weeks longer transit times. We can't count on the Panama Canal all water service, although that seems to be abating a little bit and some certain charges have even come down. But we are focusing more on the West Coast. And we're not traditionally a big West Coast shipper. But if you go back to my little calculation where, where I didn't give you any numbers, a big part of that calculation is the increase in working capital as a result of increased transit times. Well, if you can go to the West Coast, you can cut that exposure quite significantly from Asia, right? And then it will cost some more to get it from the West Coast to where it's going. I get that. But I think you'll win in most cases in that calculation. Have you got any concerns that we might see some of those bottlenecks that appeared during COVID at the West Coast terminals reappearing? I have. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not concerned about the ports. I'm just as concerned about the hinterland infrastructure as I was back in 2022. I wonder if, they've, if they're ready to cope with it, but also wonder... The unknown here is how many shippers will think like I do and how many shippers will just accept the extra 10 to 12 to 14 days transit time and keep shipping the weather shipping now, right? Every ECO, every importer is different in terms of what's their priority. Some will be happy with the longer lead times depending on their trading terms. 
some will be happy with the longer lead time because they don't have any overflow warehouse space and they're quite happy for those vessels to now be a floating warehouse. You see what I mean? This it's what's good for the goose is not necessarily good for the gander, right? It's a very individual. In terms of talking that market up, obviously carriers are, are going to be big beneficiaries of this. And we were looking at a, a serious excess supply situation for this year, which is sort of a bit of a godsend for them in, in that sense. I was also going to ask you, actually, the Hapag Lloyd tie up with Maersk. I mean, I guess that helps them offer a global service without actually having to add to that excess capacity by buying more ships as well. But it's really got them out of the muck, hasn't it? And, 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 yeah, and they helps them with their climate goals as well, because while well, they may not be as heavily invested in, in low uh, emission vessels, they'll now get to ship on, on vessels that are low or zero emission, right? So that helps them. I'm sure that most has exactly, exactly this pound of flesh uh, in, in, in return for that. Uh, in any vessel sharing agreement, alliance, cooperation, or whatever you choose to call it, there's always an imbalance between the two. Some have a better service on a long leg and will give you slots on that, but they'll charge more for those slots than they'll pay you for the slots you give them on the short leg. But you're right. I don't mean, this is a godsend for the carriers, right? Because all this tonnage will now be absorbed. I will also say this will not be the new normal forever. When sewers opens back up again, of course, there will be pressure from shippers, from forwarding uh, associations, and everything to go back into sewers. And then the problem will just come back. In the meantime, we've had time to have lots more vessels delivered from the, the big fat order book. That's not going to go away. So I think this has kicked the can down the road uh, in terms of the glut, but it's only kicked it down the road. It hasn't solved it. We've had COVID. We have serious weather issues every year now. We've got this heightened geopolitical risk with two wars. Is this the death of globalization? I don't think globalization will ever die. I think for sure it's a, it's a regression towards more regionalization, but I'm not aware of, of any regionalization that will not, to a certain extent, rely on the existence of global supply chains as well. There aren't any two regions who can fully just sort of satisfy each other in terms of, of raw material, in terms of components, in terms of goods and services. So there will always be an element of globalization, but the world economy is not a great place and China's economy is not a great place, uh, I dare say, right? And for sure, be, people like ourselves, the BCOs and shippers in general, are looking at, at the very least, regionalization, near shoring, right shoring, home shoring, whatever you want to call it. We have initiatives like that. We've had them for years. Other people have as well. But even if you regionalize uh, and say, we're going to start building one more, more stuff in Mexico, because it's much easier to service the US here. Well, some of that stuff you're building in Mexico still relies on components that you can only find in China or Taiwan or Korea or, or whatever. So no, globalization will not die. But I do agree that we are seeing a very sharp increased focus on the regionalization. Yeah. Putting your shipping analyst hat on, if you may, what does this mean for the container lines themselves? Have they bought the right ships if we're looking at more regional supply chains? What you're really asking is, what well, are these 24,000 TU vessels a big mistake? That's precise. Yeah, thanks for rephrasing it. Yeah, I was. I don't think they are. I think there are too many of them, right? But that's it's always the case, right? When somebody's the first mover, uh, usually it's Maersk, uh, in taking the, the, the size to the next level, right? But there's a good reason for it, theoretically a good reason for it. And given certain fill rates, you will achieve tremendously lower unit costs which if you're me, you'll say yes, certainly, because you'll have to give all those costs back to the shippers. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. So it makes sense. The problem is that then everyone follows suit. For now, those 24,000 CU vessels are a terrible choice, and they will be for a while. But world economy does grow, right? I mean, if you sort of look at 50 year chart of the overall growth in the world economy, it only goes in one direction uh, as a trend. So over time, there, there will be a, a, a use for these vessels. You are also seeing a trend where very few people are ordering the big ones now. They're ordering the 14s, the 12s, the 10s, the 8s, and the 6s. And, and that makes sense. The world does not need more 24,000 or 26,000 CU container vessels. But the world will need the ones that have been built and are coming out, at least over time. Bjorn van Jensen, Executive Director for International Transport at American Multinational Cummins. Thanks for joining me today on the Freight Buyers Club. Always a pleasure, Mike. 
Have a good one. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with the DeMurco Express Group. Please subscribe and follow on your platform of choice or sign up for delivery to your inbox at thefreightbuyersclub.com. This podcast wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic editing of Karen Ball and Tom Matthews. And finally, thank you all for listening. The next episode will be with you soon.